Our next speaker is Rich Tabor. Rich is the Senior Product Manager of WordPress Experience at GoDaddy. Designing, building, launching, and scaling WordPress products are his jam. But most of all, Rich loves spending time with his family and experimenting with music production. Today he's going to provide a great presentation on things he's personally done to improve the editing experience through his work with Coblox and beyond. Over to you, Rich. Hey everyone. I'm here to share some tips on how as the greater WordPress community, we can extend the block editor in many creative ways to level up the WordPress experience. We're gonna take our time and cover a wide range of topics for plugin developers looking to extend the editing experience in some fashion, for theme developers looking to make the most of what WordPress offers, and for agencies and freelancers to better extend the editor to support their clients. My name is Rich Tabor, and I'm a Senior Product Manager of WordPress Experience at GoDaddy. I joined the team just about a year ago with the acquisition of my previous projects, ThemeBeans, CodeBlocks, and Block Gallery. I'm having an absolute blast at GoDaddy, consistently pushing the editor to better empower millions of WordPress users all over the world. My slides are available online. Feel free to snag them to follow along or refer back to in the future. Uh, we're gonna cover a lot today, so you'll probably find these quite helpful. All right, so let's get rolling. Welcome to the block editor. This is the very first hint that there's something new when you open up the block editor for the very first time in WordPress. So what makes this new block editor just so wonderful? Is it that people can now build pages with relative ease, style to their heart's desire, or even reuse blocks throughout a site? Perhaps it's all of those. Because blocks are a massive step towards further democratizing publishing for WordPress. So what's our goal today? It's for each of you to leave here with a clear understanding of how we can extend the block editor to build better WordPress experiences all around. We'll zoom into the block editor, grasping an understanding of its mechanics and patterns by which we may leverage. We'll learn how to apply style and variation extensions to existing blocks in JavaScript and PHP. From there, we'll talk about the theme side of things as we dive into color palettes, gradients, and more. And last, We'll touch on styling the block editor so that our editing experience matches that of the front end. I know it's a lot, but to properly evolve WordPress, we all need to grow with it. And that's good, that's healthy, that's challenging, and that's what promotes growth. Speaking of which, a couple years ago, Matt Mullenweg introduced Gutenberg and gave us all some meaningful homework. To learn JavaScript deeply. And yes, this is still very relevant today. But as you've probably heard me say before, I'd like to add another assignment to this. Not only should you learn JavaScript deeply, but you should absolutely learn user experience deeply. The new direct manipulation interface where you grab blocks, type in text, move them around, turn on and off options, all from the block itself is such a shift from the WordPress many of us may be more familiar with. You know, the WordPress comprised of admin pages full of settings, widgets, short codes, customizer options, and even third-party applications. These bits can make for a very flexible and powerful WordPress, but these bits may also make for a convoluted and confusing WordPress even for the simplest of websites. If you think about it, user experience in WordPress has arguably never been as important as it is today. Especially when you consider that all of our blocks may be used together on the same page. Our editor blocks and extensions need to work together. They need to feel as if they were part of the editor itself, not a part. They could certainly be more powerful and more niche than what is available in core WordPress, but it should feel no different to the end user. 
So how do we accomplish that? We learn the fundamentals of design and user experience. We understand the anatomy of the block editor. And then we review guidelines set by UX patterns within core WordPress. Everything I go over today will stay 100% in line with this. So to understand user experience, we have to understand design. Design is about creating solutions for people to address a need or a problem. Now we can sit here and define the art of design all day long. But I've broken it into three categories that I find particularly important. Design is about experience. How design influences the experience of the person navigating the proposed solution. Design is accessibility. Bringing the proposed solution to everyone, regardless of anything. And design is internationalization. We're not building WordPress for the English-speaking market. To think so would be selling ourselves so terribly short. When you submit your block to WordPress.org, you're committing to internationalization. Ask yourself, how does this design translate across continental boundaries? And how does it look when my reset button has 15 characters instead of just five? And with a solid foundation in experience, accessibility, and internationalization, we can absolutely design and build beautiful extensions to empower real people to be more successful with WordPress. So let's keep these three fundamentals top of mind as we move deeper into understanding the anatomy of the block editor. So to know where we're going, what we're trying to do, what problem we want to solve for, and how we can best solve that problem, we need to understand where we are today. To do that, we'll start with the core UX patterns provided within the block editor. These are essentially a combination of solutions bundled in a reusable manner for common behavioral, structural, and creational experience patterns. Now, why is that important? Because we must absolutely grasp onto the block editor design patterns to build remarkable experiences, not blocks, not extensions, not themes, experiences. Our focus needs to remain on the person leveraging our tools to better their ideas online. Here's a pared back view of the block editor. At the block level, there are three primary interaction patterns within the editor. The block toolbar, the settings sidebar, and the block content area. And here are those areas in full context. Let's touch on these as it's important to understand where we can extend and the interactions by which we can leverage. First step, the block content area. This is the most intuitive experience level where people directly manipulate the block itself. It's considered the primary interface for adding and manipulating content. There are two main patterns we'll see here placeholders, and contextual controls. This pricing table block from Cobox demonstrates how placeholders and smart defaults can improve the creation experience of a block. The instructions will guide the user on how to input content and complete the block. And here's another example of a placeholder, this time within the Cobox masonry gallery block. A gallery block, as such, may have a placeholder component with directions on how to upload or select media to place into the gallery. Upon adding that media, the placeholder is then replaced with the rendered gallery, closely assembling what we'll see on the front end. We'll see this placeholder pattern come up again in a few as we look at extending blocks through variations. Placeholders may ask for information just as well. Here's a placeholder component that asks you for a location or an address. When entered, it then renders the block once the requirement is met. Now, apart from placeholders, 
The other primary interaction within the block content area are contextual controls. Referring back to our gallery block example, after we add media and our gallery is rendered, selecting the block will now reveal a control that gives users the ability to add more images. These kind of controls are pretty neat, but it's easy to get carried away here. Changes in the UI should be minimal, as to not disorient the user and make the block seem much more complicated than it really is. Outside of the block content area, we have two alternative methods for building our block's controls within. That's the block toolbar and the block sidebar settings. First up, we have the block toolbar. This houses block level controls. These controls should only consist of commonly used actions, which are absolutely necessary for managing a block. This is a stark contrast from a block's settings sidebar. But while the block toolbar houses necessary controls, everything within the sidebar should not be necessary for the basic operation of a block. If a block requires advanced options, those settings should reside here within the settings sidebar. There are two tabs within the settings sidebar, document and block. The document tab shows metadata and settings for the current post or page, while the block tab shows settings and controls for the currently selected block. What we're looking at here is a map block from CoBlocks. We have a settings sidebar registered for this block, which includes the zoom level and height and pixels controls. Zoom level and height and pixels is nice, but they're absolutely not required to get this block up and running, which is why they reside within the sidebar. We have also added an additional panel to include a Google Maps API support for those who are looking for a more advanced usage. So that's the basic anatomy of the editor. Now let's switch gears and talk about block style variations. Every block in the editor can have multiple looks. And some blocks in core actually already have style variants, such as the core buttons block. Notice how there's a styles panel on the right within the settings sidebar. With two button style variants provided by core, fill and outline. Selecting one will alter the style applied to this button block, but we may also set a default style for all the new button blocks that we add to a page. Core WordPress also provides style variants for the quote block. Regardless of the block, the experience of applying a style variant is exactly the same here as it should be. The only difference is the treatment of the style and the label itself. But regardless of any style that we add to any block, the interaction level of applying one of these styles is exactly the same across the board. Now how do we take advantage of block styles and apply them from a theme or a plugin? On the server side, we can use the relatively new register block style function. This takes two arguments, the first of which is the name of the block, and the second, an array of properties for the style, such as name, label, and its inline styling or style handle. The style handle is referenced if you're going to use an external style sheet, while inline is more for simple styles that are applied. So here's an example in PHP of how to register a style for the button block that we're going to call 3D. We're going to use the register block style function. We're going to use the core slash button name, because that is the name of the button block in core. And then we're going to set our properties within this array. Name will be the slug that is applied. Label is how you're going to see this style named within the editor. And then we're going to use inline style because we don't need a full on style sheet for this. All we need is a clever inset box shadow that's going to add a three dimensional pop to the button whenever it's applied. Now, if you're running a block or an extension that uses the WordPress scripts package to compile JSX, you can register styles using JavaScript as such. In this example, we're importing a couple dependencies then pretty much doing the same thing that we did on the server-side registration, just in a slightly different syntax. And last, I have an example of how to add block styles using vanilla JavaScript. The first block of code on the top 
is representing how we'll enqueue the script, while the second block is the script itself, which is still using register block style to add the style to the button block. And here's the end result. We have a new 3D style registered for the button block that applies an inset drop shadow, creating that little 3D pop we wanted. Again, the idea behind block styles is that they should change the look and feel of a block, not its contents and not its configuration. A solid rule of thumb is that these styles should be absolutely limited to styles, as in CSS styles. All right, so now let's have a look at some interesting block styles that are already released to extend the editor. The first up is Altered Reality by Nick Hamsey. It's a plugin that adds 20 plus style variants to the image block as image filters. It's pretty cool, and if you look at the code base on GitHub, I'm sure you'll find it particularly interesting on how simple it is to add this sort of functionality to the editing experience within a core block. And second, we have CoBlocks, which adds a new checkbox list style to the core list block. You see, styles are such a fantastic way to add more variation and more visual design cues to existing blocks, and both Altered Reality and Coblox really showcase that well. While registering styles is great, there may be times when you're looking to turn off the additional styling. Using the unregister block style function, you may remove any previously registered style. This receives the registered name of the block and then the name of the style. But do note that this only works for server-side blocks. If you're wanting to unregister any style variation, you need to do so using JavaScript as such. At the top here, we're enqueuing our script, and in the bottom, we're using unregistered block style with two different arguments. Again, the block name, and then the block style that we want to unregister. In this example here, we're removing the large style variant from the quote block. Now, if we return to the editor and add a quote, there's only going to be one style available, the default style, and large will be completely removed. That's it for styles, but what about block variations? Sure, the lingo can be a little bit confusing here, but while block style variations change the look and feel of a block, block variations change the substance of a block, essentially configuring it in a meaningful fashion. In core WordPress, there are two blocks that utilize variations the social and columns blocks. When you add a block that has variations available, you're presented with a placeholder of sorts that serves as a way to quickly start with the precise configuration of this block. Here's an example of how variations are displayed within the core columns block. This gives the end user a couple smart variants to work with. Instead of having to add the block, configure the number of columns, and then manually adjust the column widths. You can pretty much add a standards column layout with just a single click here. While this is great for the columns block, I've explored how block variations can extend the experience of adding a form to a page using the CoBlox form block. So here's the CoBlox form block added to a page. I've added three variations to help folks create meaningful forms with just a single click. There's a contact form, which is the default variation selected if you skip this placeholder an RSVP form, and then an appointment form. Once a variation is selected, the form variant is instantly added to the page, making a minutes long process cut down to mere milliseconds. Here's the RSVP variation from the Coblox form block. It's set up like most RSVP forms for either direct use or just tweaking from here. Registering variations is actually very similar to registering blocks. We need the name of the block, the title of the variant, the description, an icon to represent the variant, and there's a few other properties to leverage, which establish the variant's configuration. Here's how you would register a block variation if your theme or plugin is configured to process ESNext. In this example here, we're pulling in dependencies from WordPress, targeting the CoBox form block, and then adding a new event registration variation to the existing variants. In this new event form variation, I want to include a full name field, email, a text area for dietary needs, 
and then a checkbox that signifies that our attendees will follow the code of conduct. The submit button text is also set initially to register. Again, all of these attributes are configurable through the block itself. I'm just setting up smart defaults to help with event registration forms. Now with vanilla JavaScript, it actually looks pretty similar. And like with any script we need, let's not forget to enqueue it. This example actually follows the exact method of enqueuing the script as I used back in the style variations example. And as you can see here, we're actually using the exact same properties to register this block variation. And now when we go back to the editor and add a form block to the page, we'll get a new event registration block variation appended to the existing variants here. If we select that variant, we'll have our form configured properly to receive event registrations. Sure, you may need to add a field or two, or tweak some labels, but you're not starting from scratch. Variations can be crazy empowering, opening the door to helping folks get their desired result in a much quicker fashion than adding and configuring each block and each attribute. And from the developer side, we can create a wide range of solutions using one code base, one block, instead of having to maintain a multitude of solutions. So this leads us right into our next topic. The block editor is absolutely making strides towards becoming a powerful site building tool set. And I, for one, find its newest addition particularly intriguing, and that's block patterns. Block patterns are combinations of blocks that you may create and share with others to help folks make better, more unique layouts much quicker than adding individual blocks one at a time. I've put together a few examples from the web of common layouts or sections that could very well become block patterns. You see, to create any of these here, it takes a good amount of time and a little bit of finesse in order to add and then style each block appropriately. Just imagine placing any one of these patterns onto your site with just a single click. Speaking of which, let me show you how patterns work today. Currently, block patterns exist within the experimental Gutenberg plugin as of version 7.8. They are available within the drop-down menu from the more ellipsis at the top right of the header toolbar. When triggered, the block's pattern sidebar is now provided to select a pattern from. This UI likely won't stick to the sidebar implementation, but it's here so we can start solidifying the patterns API while also experimenting on how to bring this into the editor in a more natural fashion. Now adding patterns from either a theme or a plugin is relatively similar to both block styles and block variations that are previously covered. From the server side, we'll use the register pattern function. We're gonna add a title for the pattern and then content to be inserted on the page if the pattern is selected. What's interesting here is that the content is actually raw HTML. This means you may create the pattern within the block editor, switch to the code view, grab the markup, escape the raw HTML output, and paste it back here. Now refreshing the editor will display the new highlight feature block pattern we just created. Once selected, the pattern is then added to the page immediately. While patterns are still pretty experimental, I'm confident that these will make a marked difference in site building within the block editor. Just imagine being able to install your favorite site patterns onto your site perhaps from a patterns library on wordpress.org, and then build out a beautiful page in 10x less time and energy. Instead of focusing on each individual block, we can zoom out a bit and focus on the page that we're creating. If you can't tell, I'm obviously looking forward to patterns landing in WordPress. I've started identifying what combinations of blocks I'm already implementing over and over again to build out a library of patterns I can leverage once this lands in core. I encourage you all to do the same, so when patterns launch, we can take full advantage of the best that WordPress has to offer. So we've covered quite a bit so far, focusing on the block side of things, but there's a whole other side of extending the editor 
with the help of a well-oiled WordPress theme. So let's switch gears and take a look at how themes can take full advantage of what the block editor has to offer. The block editor has a number of additional enhancements that themes can opt into supporting. To opt into these new theme enhancements, all you need to do is call add theme support in the themes functions.php file for each one. So let's break these down. A theme can register its own colors to be used throughout the editor's color palette components. This can help guide the site's branding by pushing a higher level of consistency with design control. There are two parts to extending the block editor's color palette component. First, a theme needs to register the colors using add theme support editor color palette with an array of colors, and second, to provide a relevant color class for each color added. That way it can display on the front end of the site. So here's an example of that. We're just registering a simple color palette for the editor with two colors, primary and secondary. I'm passing an array of colors that specifies a translatable name to display in the interface, a slug, which is used to generate a color class, and last, the actual hex color value. Again, this should exist within the themes function.php file. And for the second half of color palette support, our theme is required to have the appropriate color classes for each color we've added. Let me explain. When a color is selected within the editor, a class is added to its corresponding element on the front end. For example, if we apply the primary color to a button block, that button will have a has primary background color class assigned to it. It's the theme's responsibility to ensure that that class directly represents the chosen color. This needs to happen for background and text color for each color in our theme's custom palette. Also, one thing that I find helpful is using a naming convention such as primary and secondary. That way, if my colors ever change in the future, I still have classes that make sense. Otherwise, I could end up with a has orange background color class with a purple hex value. Now that would be quite confusing. Now once those colors are registered and the color classes are prepared, they're all set. These new colors are available within the editor anywhere a color palette component is referenced for both core and third party blocks. All right, so next up we have editor font sizes. Some blocks allow the user to configure a font size, such as the paragraph block. While the editor has a default set of font sizes included, a theme can override those and provide its own. Let me show you how. So here's an example of registering two font sizes for the editor. I'm passing an array of font sizes, specifying a translatable name to display in the interface, a slug which is used to generate a font size class, and last, the integer pixel value of the font size. This may look quite familiar because this is actually exactly how the color palette enhancement worked. And just like with color classes, the theme is responsible for extending the styles to include font size classes for each registered size. So here I have a has small font size with the same value that it registered the small font size with, 14 and I have has large font size, also using the same value, 36. So now if we open up the editor, our paragraph block and any other blocks that use the font size picker will now display the new font sizes that our theme has registered. So next up we have editor gradient presets. I know that gradients can be a little loud, but for folks who want to leverage this within the editor, it's possible for a theme to register its own gradients instead of relying on what's in core. That way, these gradients can have the same flavor and the same vibe as the theme itself. So you might be noticing a common thread here. Extending theme gradients is also written the exact same way that font sizes are and the color palettes are. You use add theme support, editor gradient presets, and then you have an array of a name, which is the name that's used within the UI, this time we're using gradient, which defines the actual gradient for this. And then we have the slug, which is referenced for the color class. And once again, the theme is responsible for adding a proper class for the gradient to display on the front end. 
So here I have that gradient class ready to go. Once the gradients are registered, you'll have them available anywhere within the editor that blocks employee gradients. So here we have the new gradient applied to this button block. Some blocks, such as image and gallery blocks, have the ability to be set at a wide or full alignment. A theme can opt into supporting these alignments, extending the editing capabilities of a user, especially those who are building full on web pages and not just writing content. It's really not hard to do this, and it may just take only a few style tweaks, so I strongly suggest adding this enhancement to your theme. So next up for theme enhancements is dark mode. If your theme is a bit out of the ordinary and applies a darker background and or color scheme, you can opt into the editor's dark mode where the UI adjusts to better serve darker designs. While it's definitely useful, be prepared to do some old fashioned QA as it's not 100% and you'll probably need to do some minor tweaks here and there to ensure that the editing experience of your theme remains top notch. And here's an example of dark mode turned on for 2020 if I've applied a darker background color to the page. You can see that some of the UI that would normally be black is now white, or normally would be a light gray is now a darker gray to improve the contrast ratio when you're trying to read these elements. So that's it for general theme enhancements. But what about the biggest portion of a theme's control over the editing experience? Editor styles. That is, how things look and feel in the block editor when you're editing content. You know, does it resemble the front end? Does it feel like you're editing the website? With the vanilla block editor, the styling is very separated from the front end. But with clever styling within the editor, it's an absolutely revolutionary experience. To add editor styles, first you'll need to declare theme support. Then you'll tweak it from there. It's important to understand that editor styles are modified a bit just before they're rendered onto a page within the editor. All of your styles are actually scoped to the editor styles wrapper class, which is a class that surrounds all of the elements that can and should be styled by the theme. Let's take a look at what kind of difference editor style can make on a real website. So here's a page I've designed within the block editor. It's an interesting layout with columns, quotes, and both full and wide aligned imagery. It's pretty dynamic, and one of my favorites built within the block editor. This is designed without the theme's creative use of editor styling, essentially vanilla Gutenberg. It looks fine, and it works pretty good, but it doesn't feel like my website. And here's that exact same page, this time displaying the theme's editor styling in full. It's pretty close to what the front end of the website looks like, making the page editing experience feel natural and cohesive. So much so that I don't even need to go to the front of this page to verify that everything looks right, because this is essentially it. Now I mentioned how you'll likely need to tweak a few things once you apply the styling. You may need an additional style sheet that loads only within the editor, which would be enqueued by enqueue block editor assets. Common scenarios would be to set your typography sizes, colors and weights, style the background color, set the base block width, along with the wide and full alignment width, styling the title of the page to match the theme's headings, and then any block specific adjustments that arise when you're testing the theme out. It can add up for sure, but there are techniques in place to make things easier on us as developers. For one, you can pull in commonly used SAS variables within both the theme style sheet and the editor style sheet, effectively cutting the amount of style crossover in half and making it much easier to maintain moving forward. You could also employ CSS custom properties, otherwise known as CSS variables. These would be used to manipulate the styling from one central location. That's actually how the new global styles effort in Gutenberg may end up working and how we build the Go theme. The key advantage here is that it becomes so much easier to style a page if the styling is abstracted fully from the block structure itself. 
If you'd like more detail about tweaking the editor styling, dive into the 2020 theme, or even the Go WordPress theme, both of which are a solid reference point for how you can extend the editor styling to make it feel more one-to-one -one with the front of site. All right, so I covered quite a lot here. Apart from the technical bits that I touched on, if you could take one thing away from this, it should be how important the art of experience is and how we need to continuously push WordPress and ourselves towards that experience-first mindset. If we hone in on what's available in core WordPress, then layer our extensions, blocks, patterns, themes, you name it, on top of this editing experience, we will absolutely have the most empowering website publishing CMS around. I, for one, want to build a WordPress that my kids will fall in love with one day, to share their adventures, and to make their mark with. That's a key driver for me and the work that I do for WordPress. I hope you were able to glean a lot from this chat today. Don't forget to grab these slides and feel free to reach out to me on my blog, richtabor.com or on Twitter at Richard underscore Tabor. I look forward to building a better WordPress with you. So thank you. Welcome everybody to the Q&A session with Rich Tabor. I uh, hope you enjoyed his talk. We've got him live with us right now to answer some questions. Rich, how you doing? I'm pretty good, everyone. All right. Let's see. First question up. Will asks, Rich, have you had any times where you decided to block a core block from scratch instead of using a style variation? Perhaps that perhaps will you mean build a core block? Build from scratch? Yeah. 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 Um I mean I, I lean towards not trying to reinvent the wheel. So um anything that's in core, if I can layer a style variation. Far less and uh, Rich, offers. Can you hear I think me? Now? You might have broke up a little. Can you yeah, backtrack I'll just, say, just a little bit? Sure. Um, I, I I tend to leverage what's available in core uh, and keep that as a priority. So um, I'm not having to reinvent the wheel. I'm not having to maintain as much code base. Um, and if I use a variation or a style on top of a core block, when the core block gets new enhancements and new features as the editor evolves it naturally will receive those as well. Um, so I try to maintain like a hard line of not duplicating what's already available in core. Nice. And let's see, Will has another question. Can you use ACF fields with block patterns? Uh, not that I'm aware of right now. Uh, you know, block patterns are still experimental and there's still a lot going into it. Uh, perhaps, Using ACF fields, um, but right now it's based on uh, just block content that's plugged into it. Right on. It is block patterns are very fresh right now, so yeah. very new still. Let's see which block in code blocks has been the most impactful for users. Uh, most impactful. Well, we get a lot of positive feedback on the hero block. Um, you know, now the, the cover block is becoming just as powerful and just as useful. So I foresee a future where we start to promote that far more than the uh, hero block that we built. But the hero block does uh, enable a quick way to add all the, you know, the new, uh, the new things that are coming in the cover block, such as uh, positioning top left, bottom right of content, you know, the image in the background, the video in the background and buttons and whatnot, all the things that the vast majority of sites have, the planning pages and whatnot. Uh, so I you broke up just a little bit on that last part. Uh, I was just saying, yes, the hero block. <laughs> yes, the hero block. That one is one of my favorites too. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Let's see. Clayton asks, where do you see block patterns, variations, and styles living? Plugins or themes? Oh, this is this is the big one. Mm, this is a good one. You know, I think that there is room in a theme to have patterns for sure. You know, a theme can provide, you know, previously in older WordPress versions, 
themes provided templates. They had uh, layouts of content. And I think patterns are that same thing, but more evolved. And it's more um, relative to what you're adding to your page. So if you want a, you know, a theme with a lot of really cool patterns and you add it to your page and you change to a different theme, maybe the patterns, they could also exist in a plugin. The same for variations, the same for styles. Uh, they could, I would lean more towards plugins for things that manipulate the interface, but uh, patterns seem much more like a, an addition from a theme to me. But I, they could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. Sure. That does feel about right for me as well, I'd say. Uh, themes including patterns. That was a recent discussion, I think, in the community, mm -hmm. the community meetings. Yeah. Uh, last one I have today. Oh, actually, I think I might have a few more. Jamie asks, what mic are you using, Rich? Um, <laughs> right now? To, or <laughs> I want to sound this sultry on my podcasts. Uh, uh, what is this? Is, uh, this one here. It's like glue something. <laughs> well, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. That That's a great question. So let's see, some some question to get you to, uh, let's see. <laughs> Brian uh, overheard some of our conversation earlier before we came on about um, talking about global styles and how we might apply global styles to particular block types. Do you wanna talk about any of that, Rich? Yeah, you know, um... The interaction of applying a style to a block and applying a global style to be inherited through every block is, uh, you know, it could be very complex and complicated. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there's room for both. There's definitely a room for, you know, a, a zoomed out view where you can say, I want everything to be red. I want all my buttons to be rounded. I want, you know, like there's those kind of configurations, but I think that we can also kind of zoom in and uh, have some, maybe some sort of syncing mechanism to sync blocks to each other. So if, um, for example, if we have space on a homepage, we want to you know, adjust the content, adjust the spacing of all of them. There should be an easy way to perhaps opt out of syncing or opt into syncing to where if you move one space or block, they would all move. And then, or if you opt out, then you can adjust just the one. So I'm, what I was just uh, asking previously to this uh, was just like how to, just some Mark's thoughts on like what that could look like where we're syncing block settings and in, the, in a very direct manipulation interface instead of uh, so much of the pulled out zoom view. Because I think we have a solid grasp on that, on the way Global Styles is looking right now. Yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed that discussion because we've been kicking it around. Tammy Lister has been doing a lot of thinking into this. And um, it was a lot of fun uh, having that conversation with you just about syncing things. I like. We're, we're looking at ways in which we can pull global styles and a lot of these global styles might actually apply to a lot of these blocks. So how, when we adjust one block, can we really tie that in with all the other similar blocks throughout the site? So yeah. let's see, I've got another question. Any thought on having tool tips include warnings on high resource blocks? such as using the cover block with parallax or any image or resource intensive block? Uh, well, the, the cover blocks parallax isn't, isn't a true JavaScript heavy parallax. It's more of a fixed image parallax. So it's just fixed behind you. Um, so that's not super intensive. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if I foresee um, those kind of tooltips or notifications uh, within the UI. Um, I could see a use for them, but I don't know exactly if that's something that I would implement. All right, yeah. I think it would be interesting, uh, perhaps, if there was a, a warning that maybe your page weight um, that could be interesting, just like how contrast, color contrast notifications come up if you're not, uh, not using a proper contrast. Yeah, yeah. We we have been fiddling with those notifications because we definitely want, even though we are giving more control to users out there around the UI and what they can do with their content, we also want to help them so that they really do the best design possible in their, right. in their work, right? Right. Rich, it was a pleasure having you today and uh, listening to your talk. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, 
We're going to go ahead and end the Q&A session, but I want to remind everybody we have a short break, about nine minutes. And at the top of the hour, we're going to come back with Enrique Sanchez, who's going to show us how to navigate the UI in Gutenberg with just a keyboard. So stick Hi, around, everybody. everybody. Thank you, Rich. <laughs>